Should you sauna before or after exercise? And what about the ice bath craze? Does putting the two of them together really increase your health benefits or does it just cancel itself out? On today's video, we're gonna be talking all about the science behind sauna stacking and how to use it effectively to get the most out of your sweat. If you didn't see my last video on the differences between the infrared sauna and the traditional high heat finish sauna, go back and check that video out. To save you some time, the biggest impacts of an infrared sauna is that infra infrared sauna is going to be a low heat sauna. It's going to be about 120 to 140, 150 degrees. Because of that, you're going to have to stay in it for a longer period of time. Infrared saunas are also going to have near, mid, or far infrared wavelengths, which are going to penetrate deeper into the skin. This is going to help with microcirculation, stress relief, pain, and recovery. The high heat finished sauna is going to be obviously a higher heat, typically 180 to 210 degrees. Because of this, we're going to get a stronger cardiovascular effect. Finished saunas have been studied significantly for the decreases in cardiovascular mortality and also for the decrease in dementia and Alzheimer's risks. So it's important to understand what the benefits are of each sauna and when to use each one. And again, you can see all that information in my previous video. For today's video, for the most part, when we talk about sauna stacking with cold plunging and using sauna before or after exercise, we're mainly talking about those high heat finished saunas. And while you could use an infrared sauna for any of these situa situations, it's just going to take a lot longer. So again, typically the finished sauna is going to be the most effective to be utilized before or after exercise and in the stacking of cold and heat exposure or contrast therapy. So let's jump into it. Let's start talking about when we're gonna be utilizing the sauna around exercise. So some people will get on the treadmill or they'll warm up on an exercise bike or a Stairmaster or something like that before exercise and they may notice that they're able to get into their exercise routine better when they've already warmed up. This is because we're gonna increase blood circulation, we're gonna to start to elevate that heart rate. And a lot of times you can use the sauna for exactly the same purpose. If you're gonna be utilizing a sauna before exercise, we don't wanna stay in it for as long because staying in the sauna for too long, we can dehydrate ourselves and we may start to see a decrease in that peak performance. So if you're gonna get in the sauna before exercise, just try to get in it for as long as it takes to really just start to feel that heart rate elevate. The absolute best time to use a sauna is after exercise. And this is because during exercise, there's a series of stimulating or signaling molecules that are produced in the body that help to stimulate muscle protein synthesis and growth and adaptation. Utilizing the high heat sauna after exercise increases the growth hormones, it increases heat shock proteins, and it helps to really accelerate the adaptation and recovery phase. Studies actually show that a post-exercise sauna increases endurance and mitochondrial benefits. So it's absolutely amazing to get in the sauna for 15 to 30 minutes after exercise. The goal of the sauna is to increase our core body temperature to 101.3 degrees or so. That's where we're gonna get the maximal benefits from a cardiovascular standpoint and also from a heat shock protein standpoint. Now, it's not gonna be realistic to measure your core body temperature in a sauna, but if you're in a sauna that's 180 to 210 degrees, it's gonna take about 15 to 30 minutes to get there. However, if you just increased your body temperature during an exercise bout, you probably aren't gonna to have to stay in the sauna for quite as long. The next thing that we'll talk about is when to utilize sauna around cold plunge and the idea of contrast therapy. This is something that's gaining a lot of traction in recent media and a lot of people are starting to utilize it. But it's important to understand how and when to use contrast therapy and in which order we wanna use the heat and the cold. So just a quick recap of cold plunging. If you didn't see my video on cold plunging, we'll link that in the description below so you can go ahead and check that out to get a whole recap of what cold plunging is. But just a quick recap, cold plunging is for the most part going to increase noradrenaline or norepinephrine, which is a stress hormone. It's gonna increase cold shock proteins, unlike saunas, which increase heat shock proteins. We're gonna stimulate our brown adipose tissue, which is a thermogenic tissue, and we're also gonna see an increase in the immune response because of that. Now, after exercise, we don't want a cold plunge. Gatorade just released an, uh, a kind of a smear campaign against cold plunging, saying that cold plunging stops muscle development and muscle growth. And so because of that, cold plunging kind of got this bad rap. However, it makes sense if we understand what's happening physiologically and what the specific pathway is that's happening within a cold plunge that might shunt muscle, muscle growth. So I never recommend cold plunging after a, a bout of exercise, um, specifically a bout of strength training. 
Now, what's going to happen is we're going to increase or we're going to decrease mTOR, which is mammalian, mammalian target of rapamycin. This is kind of a nutrient sensing molecule within the cell. It tells the cell whether we should go into growth phase or whether we should shut down and go into more of an apoptosis type cellular regeneration phase, right? And so if we're trying to increase muscle mass, we don't want to be decreasing our mTOR, which is why we want to stay away from cold plunging after exercise. Now, in some cases, if you get into a cold plunge, and I'll kind of do this myself sometimes, is I want to cool my body temperature off as fast as possible after, say, like a long bike ride or a long run, where I don't want to keep my body super, super high, and I don't want to keep my heart rate super high. So I want to keep that, get that down quickly. I'll jump in the cold plunge after that to kind of create my own contrast therapy uh, and decrease my body temperature and my heart rate as quickly as possible, but I'm not staying in it for as long and I'm not typically gonna get in it if it's super, super cold. So when we talk about sauna and cold plunge contrast therapy, there's a couple different ways that we can do this. The traditional Nordic model of contrast therapy is going to be intermittent bouts of sauna and then cold exposure, and we always wanna end on the sauna. Uh, and the reason for that is it's going to help us kind of with some of that stress resilience and ending in a sauna is going to help us with increasing that parasympathetic activity. So if we go just from hot to cold, that's going to help with stress resilience. If we go from cold to hot, that's going to help more with stress adaptation uh, and parasympathetic activation, which again is our rest and digest. So again, true contrast therapy is going to be that alternating between hot and cold. And this is amazing kind of as a vascular workout. So we have different types of muscle in our body. We've got our skeletal muscle, which is the muscles that contract that we exercise when we're doing strength training bouts. But we also have smooth muscle in a lot of places. And smooth muscle specifically surrounds our vascular tissue. And that contraction and relaxation of the smooth muscle is what allows blood flow to go from either our periphery to our internal organs. It's what allows our blood pressure to modulate, to drive blood to different areas of the body. And just like strength training benefits our skeletal muscle, doing contrast therapy can actually benefit our smooth muscle. So when we go into a sauna, we're going to get a lot of peripheral vasodilation, which means that all that blood flow is going to be shunted to the external part of the body. When we go into a cold plunge, we get the exact opposite effect that happens where we're going to get vasoconstriction and we're going to shunt all of that blood flow back into the internal organs, to the brain, things like that. So going between the two of them can be a really great way to kind of get some of that vascular workout in. Now, with that, we need to be very careful that we're not doing this if we have a significantly compromised cardiovascular system because it does put stress on the body. And if we're in a state that we just can't handle stress or our resilience is super low, it's probably also not a good idea to be doing this type of alternation uh, of cold and hot therapy. Uh, but what we're going to do is we're going to get that increase in circulation. We're going to get a decrease in inflammation. And this is really going to help our resilience. So we talk about resilience. We've got training and we've got recovery. And you put those two together and it creates resilience. Resilience is super important from a longevity standpoint. And also just helping to make sure that we're going to be able to go through and do our workouts and everything without getting hurt, without getting sick, without the body breaking down. So doing stuff to specifically train resilience uh, is super important. So we talk about protocols, there's a couple different ways that we can do this. If we wanna just maximize our post-workouts, um, increase longevity, things like that, that's where we can do like a 20 to 25 minute sauna, the high heat sauna immediately following the workout. And then we can also pair that with some cold exposure. Now, it's always important to note that when we talk about cold plunging, you can cold plunge all the way down to 35, 38, 39 degrees, right? But we don't wanna do that in the context of contrast therapy because of going from the high heat to the cold, it can really shock the system, especially in untrained or unadapted individuals. Uh, and it can really amplify the stress response beyond where we want it to. So when we're talking about sauna exposure, sauna around 180 degrees. Uh, and then the cold plunge, we're gonna want that closer to 50 degrees, 50, 55 degrees. That's gonna be enough to trigger that stress response, that norepinephrine response. And it's gonna be enough to create that vascular constriction that we're trying to get for the vascular vascular uh, effects, right? Um, so again, post-workout, 20-minute sauna, optional cold plunge. You, this could also be just a cold shower um, to kind of constrict those muscles and kind of redirect that blood flow. On recovery days, or if we're trying to stress relief, this is where we can do kind of the the sauna to cold plunge. Typically, if it's a recovery day, we're going to want to end on heat because again, that's going to activate that parasympathetic nervous system. And what this could look like is a 20-minute sauna, 
one to two minute cold plunge. So again, we're not trying to get the benefits, the full benefit that we would typically get with a cold plunge. And we're not necessarily trying to get the, t the full benefit that we would get from a sauna. So we don't wanna go full bore on the sauna and full bore on the cold plunge. I made the mistake of going from a 45 minute infrared sauna session to a 43 degree cold plunge for four minutes. And I feel like I was gonna pass out for like an hour. I will not make that mistake again. And I would advise that you not make that mistake either. So again, if the goal is recovery and the goal is contrast therapy, we need to adapt the temperatures and the duration of time to accommodate that. Um, so again, 180 degrees or so for the sauna, about 20 minutes, cold plunging in the 50 degree range for about one to two minutes. Um, and then we can do resilience training where we cycle this. The cycling, again, goal resilience training versus goal stress relief and recovery. If we're trying to recover the body, we don't wanna be putting a ton of stress on it like we would in the cycling. So the cycling, you're gonna basically go back and forth between the two of those three to four times. This is gonna be an hour or so of work trying to kind of go between those two things. And again, that's gonna really help with vascular resilience uh, and endurance, right? Um, if you're gonna be doing the cycling like that, you need to make sure that you understand you're really extending the amount of time that you're in a sauna much past what you typically would. Again, a typical sauna session is gonna be 15 to 30 minutes. If you're cycling 20 minute sessions, you're gonna get close to 40, 60, 120 minutes in the sauna and hydration becomes extremely, extremely important. You may not notice how dehydrated you are or how much you're sweating because you're jumping into the sauna or into the cold plunge between those bouts. But again, really make sure that you are hydrating yourself and really make sure that you're getting minerals back in because when you sweat, you lose all those minerals. So getting a really good electrolyte supplement in there is gonna be super, super important with that. The other thing that I see this really beneficial for is people who are trying to detox. One of the issues that we get is just stagnation of blood flow. We're not circulating our blood to all of our tissues. And because of that, it's easy for toxins and chemicals and things like that to get bound up in tissue. And so if we're doing something like contrast therapy, we're gonna be forcing blood to move all through our body. And that increase in fluid dynamics is gonna really help pull up and circulate and get toxins into the liver to be excreted through the body. So this is something I recommend a lot on people who are going through things like mold detoxes and stuff like that. However, we don't ever wanna do this if our detox pathways aren't opened up. And so if you don't know if your detox pathways are moving, you can reach out, we can do a quick complimentary call, we can kind of talk through what that may look like. And if you need some extra support with that, I'd be more than happy to help you with it as well. So just a quick overview, again, infrared saunas, high heat saunas, cold plunges, they're all great, they all have their own benefits. Go back and watch those videos if you wanna utilize them individually. If we're trying to work, utilize a sauna around exercise, the best time to use a finished sauna is gonna be immediately following exercise for about 20 minutes. You can pair that with an optional cold shower or something like that. If we wanna cycle the sauna, typically we're gonna do a 20 minute bout of sauna around 180 degrees. We're gonna jump into the cold plunge for one to two minutes around 50 to 55 degrees. And if we're trying to build resilience within the system, we can do that for about three to four cycles, just really making sure that we're being mindful of the hydration status and of the minerals that we're taking in during that session so we're not gonna deplete our bodies. The next episode, we're gonna talk all about infrared saunas and high heat saunas and they're boosting on the immune system, defense against cold, flu, and chronic illnesses. So stay tuned, like, and subscribe, follow along for that next video, and I hope to see you there.